Okay, so for the past few minutes, I've been trying to figure out what exactly the Great Will or the Axiom are all about. Some people think that those two entities are two like completely separate beings, um, but I think, given how the Great Will and the Axiom are spoken about throughout the games, that it, they're probably the most similar. Um, they're probably like the uh, the same beings, basically. So, in Apocalypse. It's clear from Stephen that the Axiom created humanity and bestowed upon them the power of observation, which allows them to basically create beings like gods and demons from their um, from their thoughts and you know their understandings of the world, whatever. And in like the Axiom has also created um, the the god basically like YHVH, the god of law, whatever. Um, he has, like, a bunch of avatars that all, like, lead humanity astray and everything, and he also creates the messiahs, so the protagonists of the different games, and he views the, um, I guess I should say they for the Axiom, uh, it's not gonna be that consistent, sorry, but basically the Axiom creates the messiahs, aka the protagonists of the different SMT games, and views the world through their eyes, um, both in an attempt to understand humanity, I'm pretty sure, um, but also, and, like, I don't remember if the Axiom is, like, in control of the Messiahs, but I'm pretty sure they're not, because of, like, other dialogue. I think the Axiom just uses the Messiahs to understand humanity, because, you know, that makes the most sense to me. Um, and that's basically it. But, like, my interpretations beyond there are, like, basically what the rest of this video is about. So, like, I think that ultimately the Axiom probably creates all of their avatars, like God, for example, knowing that they are going to lead humanity astray, and that they create the messiahs knowing that they are going to be, like, the best that humanity has to offer. Like, when the Axiom creates humans, they know full well that those humans, the messiahs, are, like, the most capable. Like, it's still possible for them to get, like, game overs and stuff like that, um, and they don't know exactly which endings the messiahs are going to go for. Like, they aren't, like, infallible beings or anything, you know? Like, the Nahobino dies, like, five times. Um, but at the end of the day, like, my interpretation is that the the Axiom doesn't really care about alignment for the most part, because at the end of the day, the way that they see it, like, this messiah, for, like, any specific game, like, they are the best that humanity could possibly get in, like, this specific universe. Um... Like, I want, to, like, they're basically the representation of, like, humanity's greatest desires. And they want humans to be happy and fulfilled. And so, like, whatever the best has to offer, like, wants to do, then they're very for it. And that's kind of, like, a mix of the very, like, lawful and, like, chaotic ideologies, which I think is pretty interesting. Like, it's kind of might makes right, which is chaotic, but it's also kind of, like, having one representative to l rule them all, which is very, like, lawful in a way. Um, but, of course, those also, like, kind of bleed into each other, which is what the whole series is about. Um, but something very interesting is that the Axiom definitely still does like and dislike certain things. Specifically in the... We know the, this because of the Anarchy Root or the Massacre Root in Apocalypse, and we know this because of Yoko's ending in Vengeance. So... In the Anarchy route in For Apocalypse, Stephen, who is not part of the Axiom, but who understands it because he's transcended, and transcendent beings can understand the Axiom, he basically tells Nanashi, who has, like, ascended humanity and become, um, bas basically, like, taken God's place after, like, killing him, even though, like, he's gonna come back. Stephen tells Nanashi to be careful of messiahs in the future, because... Um, Stephen understands, and by extension, the Axiom understands that now that he, that Nanashi has ascended humanity, and he isn't taking like a really like pro-social, selfless um, perspective on things like Stephen has, that ultimately like Nanashi is going to be a threat to humanity's like safety or like free will in the future, and therefore the Axiom is going to use Messiahs in the future to like try to stop Nanashi or at least like to fight back against him. Um, it's kind of ambiguous if, like, because he's ascended, like, Nanashi can't be truly killed anymore, kind of like how God always comes back. Um, that's up to your interpretation. I don't, I don't really know. Um, but either way, like, Nanashi creates his own world from, 
like the souls of those who have come before him. He like completely resets everything and he becomes like the new ruler. Um, but the axiom doesn't carry like a special vendetta against Nanashi. Like the final battle against God doesn't have like any additions to it or anything because like Nanashi is on the anarchy route specifically. Um, like the entire route is more difficult, but it's not like a God fights harder. It's not like the axiom really sends any like wrenches into their plans or anything like the fight against satan that comes before is more difficult and satan is like also a transcendent being at least to a certain extent but you know what i mean it's not like the axiom like has a personal vendetta it's not like the axiom is going to be on like the warpath against anashi specifically until he's taken care of at the end of the day the axiom still recognizes anashi as a messiah just one that has like made a choice that was not necessarily expected. Um, meanwhile, in Yoko's ending, um, or really, first of all, in all of the endings of Five, um, and of Five Vengeance, kind of, like, Lucifer is like, I want to destroy the Mandala system. Lucifer has ascended by absorbing God's knowledge. Lucifer understands the axiom and all that. He still wants to break free of the Mandala system, kind of like how the axiom always wants people to break free of, like, God and his other avatar so i think that the mandala system was also created by the great will or the axiom or whatever and he created um the nahobino knowing that they would be able to like free that specific universe from the mandala system that's why lucifer who has transcended at that point is like okay this is my champion i'm gonna reactivate algami have him come to me um and then we'll be free don't know what ending he's gonna get but any ending is better than being in the mandala system and that's why again like in the true neutral ending of the canon of creation, like, I think Lucifer talks more. Either that or, like, he talks the same amount, but his dialogue is, like, more spread out because the fight does last longer and it's, like, more difficult. But I think that's just, like, gameplay bullshit. Because, um, like, there's no real reason. Because, like, either way, like, Lucifer helps you defeat the Mandala system. He doesn't, like, hold back on you or anything. It's not like the Mandala system isn't broken in any specific ending in, like, SMT5, and the only exception to that is when you destroy the throne, which, where it's like, okay, the Mandala system, like, doesn't even matter anymore at this point, you know what I mean? Because you can't really, like, create a new world or, like, keep the Mandala system going if the throne is destroyed. But something interesting is that in Yoko's ending, in Vengeance, Lucifer is like, okay, this is not the ending that I personally would have chosen, but I'm still going to help you, like, overcome this. I'm still going to help you, like, destroy the Mandala system. Again, like, Lucifer doesn't fight harder. The final boss fight is not more difficult or anything. Unlike in, like, Devil Survivor 2, where when you're trying to kill Polaris, she fights a million times harder, and the final battles are more difficult or anything. Like, Lucifer, still, like, completely on the Nahobino side, but Yoko's ending does diverge from all of the others in 5, um, except for the one where you break the throne, because you ultimately reduce the world to, like, how it used to be. And the axiom very much does not like it when you trample on the work on the world that has, like, come before you, basically. Like, the axiom does not, like, completely hard resets in the same way that he doesn't like the anarchy ending in um, Apocalypse because you're destroying the world and creating a new one where you're, like, the... Um, like, the top dog, basically, like, where you're in God's place. It's not just as simple as, like, Nanashi ascended, and that's it either. Forgot to mention that in the past, sorry. In Yoko's ending, you're like, fuck this new world, fuck the people who came before, and the throne or anything, like, I'm starting over. Like, the Axiom likes that they get rid of the Mandala system, but that's it. And there's no indication that the Axiom is gonna, like, send messiahs to the Nahobino or to Yoko in the new world, unlike with Nanashi and Apocalypse. But that's probably because Nanashi, or that's probably because the Nahobino and Yoko are not ruling the New World or anything. So they haven't really, like, ascended in the same way that Nanashi has, um, even if they are, like, also powerful enough. Like, I feel like the Nahobino is probably stronger than Nanashi, even post ascendance. But the thing is, they aren't, like, trying to rule the world in Yoko's ending. Meanwhile, in Tao's ending, like, Lucifer and the Axiom are both completely behind you in Vengeance because. Like, yes, you're breaking the Mandala system, but that's a good thing. But you're not trampling on the, wor on the work that has, like, come before you on, like, the other ruler's shoes or anything. Like, the world that exists in Tao's ending 
is still loyal to the one that came before or whatever, even if you're going in like a different direction because it's made like on the same foundation. I know that's like very rambly and I was probably like repeating myself a million times, but yeah, so that's how I interpret the axiom. Ultimately, it is very pro humanity and pro decision making, but it's also very like narrow minded when it comes to expecting um like the greatest humans to be the only ones that are listened to. Um it is loyal to the past, but it's also not like vindictive or anything against people who want to completely start anew. Um it purposely hinders humanity by creating systems and beings who are going to cause immense suffering. Um and it willfully creates endless cycles in the hopes that the best of humanity will overcome them. And ultimately, I think that's a pretty good interpretation, and it also, like, makes a lot of sense when you factor in the fact that, like, the Atlas games, like, regardless of the series, like, they want you to think about the world and the cycles of violence and abuse that go on, um, and also, like, how to rise above them while knowing that humanity as a whole is very flawed and that even though some things cannot be truly defeated, it's always important to stand up against them. And yeah, I really love these games. And even though they're really stupid sometimes, I think that this is a cool thing to think about. So bye.